Hello, my name is Drew Fustini. Uh, the Embedded Linux Conference North America and Europe are always a highlight for me every year. It's too bad we can't be together in Dublin, but I'm excited to be a part of it virtually. So I wanted to talk to you today about two of my favorite things, which are Linux and open source hardware, and how RISC-V plays into that. I'm an open source hardware designer at a PCB manufacturing service in the US. I'm also on the board of directors of the Beagle Board of Drug Foundation. You might be familiar with the BeagleBone, which is a small open source hardware Linux computer. I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Source Hardware Association, or OSHWA. We have an open source hardware certification program that you can take part in. I'm also a RISC-V ambassador for RISC-V International, and I'll talk a little bit more about that organization later. There's RISC-V virtual meetups all around the world, including Munich and Bay Area. And while they're not in person right now, you can find ones that are in your time zone at risk5.org. And coming up in December is the big annual event uh, for RISC-V called the RISC-V Summit, which will be happening December 8th through 10th. I moved to Berlin, well, I'm from Chicago, but I moved to Berlin um, last year and I started the Berlin Embedded Linux Meetup along with Lucas Hartman. Uh, if you're interested, join the group. We're not re meeting right now, but when we're able to, we'll, we'll start meeting again, hopefully. And a really cool project that Lucas has been working on for several years now is the Reform Laptop, and it's finally shipping. It's a completely open source from the mechanical to the electronics to the software laptop. So what is open source hardware? So it's hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So in the context of electronics, this means the schematics and the board layout are shared under an open source license. And this would be the editable source files. So if you're using KiCad or you're using Eagle, it would be the files from that program, not just an output format. And also the bill of materials or parts list. And it's not a requirement, but the best practice is to uh, use components that are available from distributors in low quantities. Um, I've also been asked, do you have to use an open source CAT tool? And it's not a requirement, um, but it is the best practice because the idea here behind open source hardware is you're trying to enable collaborative development. Um, so lowering the bar to entry um, so that you don't need, uh, you can get parts in low quantity and you can use open source software to edit the designs. So that's going to um, increase the number of people that can participate in that project. I talk more about open source hardware and in certain aspects like licensing uh, during this talk last December and you can watch the video. So I wanted to talk about RISC-V today and it's an instruction set or an ISA. This is the interface between hardware and software. So for example, you have a C++, a C++ program and it gets compiled into instructions for your processor to execute. But how does the compiler know what instructions the CPU understands? This is defined by the instruction set architecture. So the ISA is a standard. It's a set of rules to define the task that the processor can perform. Um, but proprietary ISAs like x86 and ARM, they require licensing. So you can't just use them. So RISC-V is a free and open source instruction set. It was started about 10 years ago at UC Berkeley by a group of computer researchers led by Chris Dasanovich. He gives a talk called the RISC-V State of the Union a couple times a year. So that link is to the latest one. So you might wonder what is RISC? So RISC stands for a reduced instruction set computer. So this goes back to a um, new concept in computer architecture from the early 80s and it's become quite dominant. For example, ARM is a RISC, RISC, RISC instruction set. Uh, and then you might wonder why the V or the 5. So that's because this is the fifth instruction set to come out of UC Berkeley. But why do I say it's free and open? This is because the RISC-V specifications are licensed under the Creative Commons attribution license. So what's different about RISC-V? Because there's a lot of instruction sets out there. So the idea behind RISC-V was they wanted to start with a clean slate, given all their experience from the previous generations of RISC instruction sets that they had helped to find. And the idea was to make it simple. 
in far smaller than other commercial ISAs like Intel or, or ARMv8 and have a clear separation between unprivileged, which is like the bare metal code, and privileged ISAs, which is, you know, what you'd be using for running a full operating system. Another key concept was separating the specification from the implementation. So not having microarchitecture be part of the instruction set so that you'd be free to implement it how you see best fit. It's also a modular ISA that's designed to be extensible and be able to be specialized. So there's a small standard base with multiple standard extensions, which makes it suitable for everything from a tiny microcontroller to a big, powerful supercomputer. But it's also stable because the base and standard extensions are frozen and then additions are made via optional extensions but it's not a new version of the base ISA underneath it. So there's four base integer instruction sets, uh, the first of which is uh, RV32i, which is 32-bit. Then it's less than 50 instructions. Uh, you can look there, and if you looked at x86 or maybe ARMv8, this is much, much smaller. There's also an embedded variant that has smaller number of registers um, to save on resources. Uh, but probably the more common one will be RV64i, which is 64-bit integer. There's even 128-bit, which might seem a little silly, um, but experience has uh, the, the experience of the designers were that you can you can never have enough address space. That that's the thing that if you run an address space, it's really hard to work around that. And with non-volatile RAM capacities increasing, we may need that sooner rather than later. It's also beneficial for security reasons as well to have a large address space. So the RISC-V base is, gets added these standard extensions. Um, so for example, there's M, which is multiply divide, A for atomic, which is useful if you have a multiprocessor system, and then you have different precisions of floating point, F, D, and Q, and then G is for general purpose. So this is shorthand for integer, multiply, atomic, flow in double precision flow. And then C is for compressed instruction coding. And this helps conserve memory in cache and similar to, you might be familiar with arm thumb. And then there's also additional extensions um, that are being worked on such as vector processing. But these won't require a new base version of the ISA. And then more practical for my interests, Linux distros like Debian and Fedora are targeting specifically RV64 GC. So those that's the base ISA and the standard extensions that Linux distros are targeting. And the base and the standard extensions, these were frozen in 2014 and then they were ratified in 2019. So if you were to compile a program right now for RV64 GC, you know, in 20 years from now on some giant RISC V fancy processor, it'll still be able to run. So to give you a sense of the, the landscape of the base ISA and the standard extensions, this is all the instructions on one card. And if you compare that to x86 or ARMv8, um, I would say it's much smaller. If you want to get more in depth in the instruction set, I recommend the RISC-V Reader. It's a pretty short book, about 100 pages, and it gets you up to speed really quick. It's also available in several different languages. So RISC-V is seeing increasing adoption in industry. RISC-V International now controls the specifications at uh, RISC-V.org. Um, they took over from the original group at Berkeley. It's a nonprofit organization, it keeps on growing. There's last, last I looked, there were 690 members. It's probably past 700 by now um, from 50 different countries. And this includes companies and universities and nonprofits. Um, and you can, as an individual, join yourself. And it's free for individuals to join. It's free for nonprofits and universities to join. And one of the great things is the RISC V International has a YouTube channel with hundreds of talks from the last several years. And one of the ways I've learned a lot about RISC V is by watching those talks. So I highly recommend checking it out. <clears throat> one of the things that's quite exciting is that companies plan to ship billions of devices with RISC V cores. NVIDIA is already shipping RISC-V cores for system management tasks in its GPU products. And Western Digital, a couple years ago, announced that they were going to replace 
all the controllers in their storage project storage products with risk V. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that they're doing this is to allow them to innovate in the microarchitecture. Like they have a core now um, that they're going to be using that has two hardware threads and a power efficient microcontroller. Another reason companies might be interested in RISC-V is to avoid ISA licensing fees and royalty fees, um, including the legal costs, and then also to avoid the long delays that can come about with these complex licensing agreements. So it's not usually where you just go and download something. It's usually a rather long process to actually license the core and get in and start designing with it. RISC-V also gives companies freedom to choose the microarchitecture implementation. So one thing to keep in mind is that only a few companies like Apple, Samsung, and Qualcomm have ARM architecture licenses that allows them to do their own custom implementations of the instruction set. Everyone else is just licensing cores, and that doesn't give as much room to be able to differentiate um, their processor from other companies that are licensing the same core. Companies also have the freedom to leverage existing open source implementations. So since the instruction set is open, um, there's several open source implementations, um, such as Rocket and Boom out of Berkeley. ETH Zurich has the Pulp team, and they have several popular cores like Risky and Ariane. And Western Digital has their Swerve cores, one of which is that microcontroller with uh, two hardware threads, which is quite innovative. But one of the really important things when it comes to um, instruction sets, and one of the reasons why Intel has maintained such dominance with x86, is the software. And RISC-V is doing really well in that regard. Uh, there's already critical mass for software support um, with RISC-V. So Linux and BSD and GCC and glibc in Clang, I'll support RISC-V. Um, Real-time operating systems like FreeRTOS and Zephyr support RISC-V. And QEMU supports emulating RISC-V as well. That link there that says well-supported software, that'll take you to a GitHub um, repo where RISC-V Foundation keeps, or RISC-V International now, keeps a list of um, the current state for all the different languages and all the different libraries and operating systems with regards to RISC-V. And back at the Embedded Linux Conference North America in June, um, Cam gave a great talk about the state of software development tools. So I recommend checking that out as well. So RISC-V International is based in Switzerland. Before that, there was the US-based RISC-V Foundation. And at the beginning of this year, they reincorporated in Switzerland. And this was to avoid any political issues since um, Many of the members are outside of the U.S., so with Switzerland, they won't have to worry about those sorts of issues. Um, and RISC-V has also become very interesting at the national level. So organizations like the European Union and nations like India and Pakistan have national initiatives to do RISC-V processor designs. And this is driven by the desire to have sovereignty over technology and also be able to avoid backdoors from other nations. There's also strong interest from chip makers in China. So US companies were banned in 2019 from doing business with Huawei. So you have to you have to think that other Chinese companies are probably wondering who is going to be next in terms of these restrictions. Thankfully for Huawei, ARM is deemed to be a UK origin technology. So it was okay to do business with Huawei, but you know how long will that last? And how will the NVIDIA acquisition impact all this? So that in uncertainty is really driving more and more companies to look at RISC-V as a way to uh, reduce the uncertainty when it comes to their ability to have their technology roadmaps go forward. <clears throat> So sometimes I hear people ask, uh, is, is RISC-V an open source processor or an open source CPU? And that's not quite right. So RISC-V is a, just a set of specifications under an open license. So the RISC-V implementations can be either open source or proprietary. 
but open specifications make open source implementations possible. So we can't have an open source processor for a proprietary ISA like x86 or ARM. So RISC V being open makes it possible for us to have open source processors.